This is um, week two of the 100th anniversary of the woman's right to vote. Um, this is about the 19th Amendment uh, today. And that amendment, uh, it, it, you know, giving women the right to vote, was based on legislation that was written up in 1878 and not passed. And so for 41 years, it sat on the shelves collecting dust. And so in 1919, they dusted it off, passed it. Of course, by the time you know, they pass legislation like this, it's going to be an amendment to the Constitution. The states have to ratify it. And you need three quarters of the states to do that. So by the time they get all that ratification uh, that process done, it's not until April 18, 1920, that women can really vote. But they, at least they, are, they can vote in time for the 1920 election. Uh, having said that, how, do you, how did you get to this 19th Amendment anyway? Uh, you know, it filters down actually from the 13th Amendment of 1865, the, 18th, the, uh, the, the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment of 1868, and then finally the 15th Amendment of 1870. Of course, that amendment was, uh, there was a big discussion about that, and I, re and I, and I mentioned that last week. I'm going to go into it a little uh, again here because it's, it's necessary. Between the abolitionists and the suffragettes, who at one point had been together here, working together, uh, not, not only to really uh, get rid of slavery, which they were both, in, both fans of, but also perhaps maybe to advance the cause of women. However, they're going to have that split after the, after the Civil War. Uh, and so you see here this, and that's interesting about political amalgamations. You know, I mean, you can actually go back to what you call the Democratic Party today. You know, that used to be the party of the working man, right? Yeah, what, happens when, what happened when they gave up being part of the working man? They went out, they opted for that touch of mink like the Republicans did, and now the working man is out. Can't even really get a jump start here in politics in, in, uh, in, in Washington. And that was really probably, the, uh, the argument can be made, that was probably the end of class-based politics in this country. Interesting, so these political amalgamations are fascinating. However, having said that, yeah, when you go back to, and I'll start here with the women, the late 1850s going into the Civil War, Again, they were on board, for the most part, they were on board with the abolitionists, the American Anti-Slave Society, which women began to join, 1838, 1839. So they had been at, many of them had been at this for a while. And, you know, people like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, who I'm going to talk about next week. She's a fascinating character. Uh, you know, Lucretia Mott, Lucy Stone, and those ladies, some of the big guns of the women's movement. Uh, but, you know, in, in, 18, in 1862, they're going to form something here called the Woman's National Loyalty League. Now, this is really, really, according to historians uh, who, who are familiar with this, with this type of American history, this is really that first real political affiliation for women. There's 5,000 ladies in this. 5,000. That's a lot. Of course, it's up north, not down south. And what they're going to do is, you know, trying to push the agenda of the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, this, you're going back to 1861, 1862, when really, you know, the idea we get now is that slavery was a big reason for the war. I'm not going to slight slavery. That's not what I'm going to do. But there were some, like Lincoln, who wasn't hot to trot in the beginning here of getting rid of slavery. He, he, he wasn't. He even, he even writes that and he states that in speeches. I know, I've got, a, I've, I've got his writings at home. Interesting, 1859, 1860, in many respects, black men, are, black men are not the equal of white men. He writes this. Of course, I'm wondering how much of that is to try to advance his political agenda here. You have to call that in the question, wasn't he a politician? Yeah, of course he was. And plus, on top of that, he is, he is the standard bearer for this thing known as the Republican Party, which is beginning to come up here. But as the war goes along, 1861, 1862, and the North isn't winning it yet, how do you want to undermine the Southern economy? Urging slaves to revolt, urging slaves to leave, you know, trying to upset that, upset that, upset that, 
real, that real mechanism for the, so, for, the, for the agrarian capitalism that's being practiced below the Mason-Dixon line. Without slavery, you don't have a plantation system, at least the way it was structured. You don't. So you attack the economy. And this is really what you're going to see. This is really politically what you're going to see done militarily after 1863, when Grant, Sherman, Sheridan, and them attack the southern economy. However, having said that, these women looking to push the agenda for the Emancipation Proclamation, especially when you, when you see people like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who really don't want an amendment to give the black man the right to vote, how about a universal amendment? Everybody votes. Women, white men, black, white, whatever the case may be. Whatever the case may be. So they're going to organize a petition movement. And with this petition movement, 2,000 ladies are going to carry this petition through the North, what's, or what's called the United States, what you want to call the Union, whatever you want to call it. And in this petition, to get support for the Emancipation Proclamation, they generate 400,000 signatures. It is the most successful petition in the history of the United States up to this point, 1863. That's a lot of signatures. That's a lot of signatures. And it dawns on some of these ladies, like Stanton, Anthony, and them, that men right now have the right to vote. But what's to stop us from pursuing our agenda with the petition? Nothing, really. Nothing, really. However, when the war is over, what necessity is there for an abolitionist movement? Interesting, there's really no justification for it anymore. There really isn't. And so what's going to happen to that amalgamation with women and abolitionists? You know, some of these political, some of these political uh, amalgamations don't last. However, bouncing off the Emancipation Proclamation, Amendment 13. Keep in mind, we haven't had an amendment here since... Let me see here. The last amendment applied to the Constitution, the Amendment 13, was 1865. The last amendment, number 12, had been 184. There's a little bit of a. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I can. I got the. I got my book here. I can check it. Amendment 13, ratified 1865. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Section 2, Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. And so it would seem, by that terminology here, that slavery and indentured servitude are over. Of course, there are some people you're going to run into uh, who follow this sort of thing, uh, privatization of incarceration in this country. You know, where companies like Apple, Starbucks, Nordstrom's, GE, companies like this are using uh, imp uh, prisoners in this country, upwards of a million of them, uh, to do some of their work. And some of these people, depending on what, depending if it's a federal prison or a state prison, and you find this more down below the Mason-Dixon line, here we go again, uh, where they're getting paid maybe as low as 25, 26 cents an hour. Yeah, you can, con you can start with contacting critic, uh, uh, Correction Corporations of America. Um, and the GEO Group was another one. Um, but if you type, you, in fact, you can actually read some of their, you know, you know how these companies come out with their yearly, their yearbook on earnings and so on and so forth, and business projection and so on and so forth. You know, buy our stock because of this. You know how that goes. Uh, you can find, you can find their, their, their yearlies right online. And I've read some of them. They're interesting to read how some of them think, gee whiz, this, this type of business has a future. And so some of these companies are also the ones holding the immigrants coming across the border. 
you know, they're making money on this. <laughs> they're making money on this. So, and so when you go back from years earlier, uh, you know, since slavery is over with, but when you go back into the, especially the 90s, uh, you know, coming out of the Reagan years, going to the 90s with the Clinton years, you see an explosion of these, of these privatized uh, incarceration companies, especially arresting people for maybe a few ounces of marijuana. Now, now, you, now you get these people in jail, and the taxpayer pays for it. In fact, in New Jersey, and I think it was Credit Corp, I think it was uh, uh, Corrections Corporation of America, I'd have to double check, that struck a deal, I think it was with New Jersey, that the deal they struck is that the prison has to have a 90% occupation rate. If it falls below that, the ta they, are, they are able to charge the taxpayer as if it was 90% or higher. That's corporate socialism is what that is. And so, and you, know, you, know the, you know the, you know the uh, journalist Chris Hedges? He teaches in prisons in New Jersey. And he writes glowingly about this because he sees it. You know, how these guys maybe get paid maybe 20-something bucks a month, yet to buy the Reebok sneakers that they really need for that footwear to last, they're over $40 a month. Over $40 they cost. So. How do you think that, how do you think 20 something bucks stretches for a $40 pair of shoes? So, interesting. But anyway, that you see here this idea of ending slavery and indentured servitude. Mainly slavery, the argument is here. Well then why do we need an abolitionist movement for? However, the complexion changes because of politics. And the ladies are going to be involved in this. You know, the American Equal Rights Association, where Stanton and Anthony and all those ladies are involved in this, are, is, going to, is going to result in a split here. You know, this, this, this organization is going to be really hammered here because of the divide between the abolitionists and the suffragettes. And so as Susan B. Anthony is giving, a, giving talks out in the Midwest, or the, or, the, or the end of the country at this point, because those other areas east of the, west of the Mississippi really aren't states yet to speak of. And so she's urged to come back because of this growing divide, which Stanton tells her that, you know, the, the, that, that some of the abolitionists now want to make, give the black, work on getting the black man the right to vote, not women. Part of this is the Republican Party, this fledgling Republican Party. Because now since the South has been defeated and, and the Southern aristocracy has lost their political power and the plantation system is going the way of the dodo here because now you're beginning to see long-term urbanization, factories, so on and so forth. That's going to come over a period of time that in, in, that in, in this environment here, uh, there's going to be two million black men able to vote. And since it's the party of Lincoln that supposedly freed them, who do you think the Republicans want, which party do you think the Republicans want them to join? The Republicans. Can they keep control of the South this way? That's the general idea here. That's the general idea. And so, interestingly enough, you know, President Andrew Johnson, he was Lincoln's vice president. He's not a Republican, he's a Democrat. <laughs> And Republicans supported him because he was anti-Southern anti aristocracy, supposedly champion of, of, the, of the poor white, poor white farmer. Yet he drags his feet with regards to Reconstruction, and the Southerners are able to get elected into, the, into Congress, ex-Confederate officers, ex-members of the Confederate Congress, and so they're going to try to combat this. And so... The, 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 the abolitionists, like Wendell Phillips, William Lloyd Garrison, are telling the ladies, join us and join the Republicans. We'll get the black man the right to vote. Then we'll get the ladies the right to vote. Some will go along with this. Some will. Some will not. Like Stanton and Anthony. No. You know, Susan B. Anthony here. No, we fought this war. Let's have a universal amendment. Everybody votes. Men, women, black, white, doesn't make any difference. And so now you're going to see Lucy Stone, Julia Howe, who are going to go along with that Republican uh, abolitionist agenda. Let's get the black man done first. Then we can get the Republicans and the abolitionists on our side, go for a full court press and get women the right to vote. And Stanton doesn't agree with this especially when it was thought at one point in that amendment to get the black man the right to vote 
terminology such as male suffrage would be in that amendment. What would that mean if you're, if you're a lady back then? What do you think that means? We'll never get the right to vote. Male suffrage. Wow. That's dangerous terminology if you're a woman. That really is. And that's what Stanton brings up. That terminology won't be in that amendment, but that was what was believed was going to be in that amendment. However, in 1868, interestingly enough, the 14th Amendment comes out. This one's a little more involved. I'm not going to read the whole thing because that, that, that's counterproductive. And this is what Susan B. Anthony will gravitate to. You know, the, the 13th Amendment outlaws slavery and, ind and, and indentured servitude. But it's the 14th that's really, that really, uh, really lends to the argument here. Section 1, this is ratified in 1868. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction equal protection of the laws. Now, that doesn't say anything about color. It doesn't say anything about gender. All persons. And so Susan B. Anthony is going to go on the attack here. Persons. What is it saying here about that? What is it saying that 14th Amendment? It doesn't mention anything about color. It doesn't mention anything about women, men. Persons. Persons. Persons are going to be citizens. Are women persons? Are they citizens? Yeah. Okay, then why can't they vote? That's her argument. Yet, in the end, Stone and Howe are going to go with those abolitionists and with those, those Republicans to get the black man done first because of that political agenda. And on top of that, the abolitionists who were contributing money to the, to the women's suffrage cause now withhold the money. That's a problem. That's a problem. Now, interestingly enough, when you take a look at these two amendments, if you read the first 12 amendments to the Constitution, you know, the, the, the first 10, the Bill of Rights, and then, the, and then the 11th and the 12th, those are amendments that cater to a certain respect to individuals. Not so now. And that's what Southerners seem to, th seem to see here. They are now, since the defeat of the South, now making, now making additions to the so-called Bill of Rights with these amendments to the Constitution, which are now giving Washington greater power. That's going to be in that discussion here. Interesting what it says here. Note, note, note the terminology here. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except except in the, as a punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist in the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Section 2, Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. What do you think the Southerners are seeing here? They wipe out slavery, they wipe out the plantations, they defeat us in a war, the Jeffersonian idea, the Jeffersonian idea here, this so-called, you know, this, this idea of the agrarian as the salt of the earth and the real, the real defenders of Republican limited elective government as opposed to the Hamiltonian notion of industrialization slash finance, that's been defeated. That's what the Southerners see. And they feel that since the, the ditch digger, the farmer, the one who digs in the dirt, is the best protector of this form of government that now that's been defeated. Now industrialization and finance come along. Keep in mind in 1860 most Americans did not like corporations. They thought corporations were a threat to the republic. How has that worked out? <laughs> How's that worked out? And so at this point, you know, that's part of this discussion. That's part of that's part of this that's part of this argument. And so you're beginning to see here, and the Southerners aren't totally incorrect about this. You are now beginning to see Washington assert its authority. 
and the Republicans now trying to build that base see two million black men in the South as a way of bolstering their power, especially in the South. Well, where does that leave the ladies here? That splits the movement. They are caught up in this argument for what they think is going to be the greater good for women. Again, you know, you're, and, then, and then you see two organizations sprout up. The National Women's Suffrage Association, which some of these ladies, like, like uh, Lucy Stone and Julia Howe, are going to split off and form the American Women's Suffrage Association. And sure enough, in 1870, you're going to get the 15th Amendment. The Republicans and abolitionists won their point. 1870. You know, and that's a lot of, that's quite a few amendments in, in a five year period here. The 13th, the 14th, and the 15th. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or, or, or any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Note that terminology. The right of citizens of this country, the United States, to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or, any, or by any state, they made sure they put that in, on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Section 2, the Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Number one, what Stanton was concerned with, that would appear in this amendment, male suffrage, doesn't appear. But it says, shall not be denied on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. That's bouncing off the 13th. Neither slavery nor, ind nor ind indentured servitude. Where's the word gender or sex? That, those words are missing. Those words are missing. And that's what Anthony and Stanton were concerned with. But this causes a split in the woman's movement. And that split will last until for the next 20 to 25 years. Now the National Women's Suffrage Association will attack the idea of getting women the right to vote with Washington. The American Women's Suffrage Association will attack this agenda by focusing on the states. Thinking if they can get a state here, a state there, they add up. That's not an injudicious thought process, depending on what state. Now, keep in mind, in 1869, Wyoming gave women the right to vote in that state. Utah will follow. Utah, you would think, you, you know, Utah? 1870. Colorado is going to do it in the 1890s. Of course, why is that? Believe it or not, in a way, they're more liberal than they are east of the Mississippi River. Of course, east of the Mississippi River, isn't that where the so-called establishment is? Yep, and there's another reason for that. You know, you look at Wyoming in 1869, as people are moving in here, it's gonna be a territory. Eventually, territoryhood means what? Statehood, right, eventually. Uh, what do you see here? Men want women to come here. So, subterfuge, there's, there's a good word for this. There's a good word for this. Women, we want women to come here. Yeah, what are they doing? They're probably voting on local issues. Go back to what I mentioned last week, the first woman who, who really voted in this country, according to American historians, this is 1756. Lydia Taft, up in Uxbridge, Massachusetts. There's a metropolis for you. Uxbridge, Mass. Of course, having said that, and I can't say for sure, her being a rich widow may have had something to do with that. But you had to own property. Remember that. You had to own property. You had to be a white male property owner. 21, most of these. But keep in mind, she, but she's voting in 1756, 20 years before the Declaration of Independence. We're not even a country yet. We're not even a country yet. But having said that, you know, and then go back to what I mentioned last week too, you know, you had to be a property owner to vote. If you were a white man, a poor white man with no property, you think you're voting in the beginning stages of this country? No, you're not. Limited, limited suffrage is what you're seeing. Well, people like Anthony want to open this up. 
And, and interest, you know, and I always find organizations that limit women uh, fascinating from the perspective, you know, when it comes to solving problems, why would you want to cut your brain power in half? To me, that makes no sense at all. Yes. Yeah, that depended on how many districts these territories be to become states are going to draw up. Well, there are going to be some women, pardon me, there will be some women, you know, like, in fact, later on, I, m I mentioned Lydia Taft. Yet in New Jersey in 1776, they were allowing women to vote. Of course, they had owned property. Now, some did own property. And some of that was because, interestingly enough, you know, one of the big bugaboos here for women, and this, and this had been going on for a decade, and I mean decades, alcohol. Alcohol. Because in most states in the 19th century, even if a woman, you know, God bless her, could get a divorce, guess who got the kids? Not her, right. The abusive husband. Same thing here with woman's pay. You know, of even if a woman had a job, she brought her pay home. Do you think she kept it? She had to give it to her husband or maybe gave her a stipend, right? And so there are, and so that was Anthony's first stop. Well, let's, let's make sure that women can get the kids. Let's make sure equal pay for equal work. That was part of her agenda early as opposed to voting. I mean, she'll latch on to the voting issue, yes. But she was concerned with, because she went through that. She's a teacher. You think she's getting paid as much as a man in New York? No, she's not. And that resonated with her. But having said that, having said that, yeah, in New Jersey, and they're going to reverse this eventually. You get into the early part of the 19th century, they're going to reverse this. Uh, Kentucky, Kentucky uh, passed legislation giving women the right to vote. Now, I think you had to be 21 and own land. Now, owning the land, how'd they get land, right? How'd they get land? Some of it came from their fathers who saw, you know, with the inheritance here, if my daughter's married to a drunken sod, you think I'm going to let him take part in getting that land that I worked hard to get? No. Who are you going to give it to? Your daughter. Your daughter. And in, some and in some respects then, she's now a property owner. She can vote. But then Kentucky's going to reverse that and take women's rights, uh, women's rights for voting away from them. And so again, women have had a tough time here. <laughs> They're going to suffer a lot of lumps, bumps, and bruises here. You had your hand up, and then I'll get to you, Keith. Yes. Yeah, if, right. Yeah, yeah. some of their, their fathers would leave them. The, why would you leave it to your drunken son-in-law? What are you going to do with it? He's going to drink the value out of that land. They're going to lose the land. So I'll leave it to my daughter. She's not drinking. He is. You know, of course, if the girl was smart, now that I got the land, get out. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Well, at the same time here, you know, when I, and I mentioned last week, too, about that Liberty Party, that fledgling Liberty Party, which also supported the Liberty League, which was anti-slave. And at their 1848 convention, Lucretia Mott was here, and she was nominated to be their VP candidate in 1848. She got five delegate votes. She doesn't win it. But she got five delegate votes. Wow. That's interesting. Of course, she was one of the lead female speakers on the circuit at this point. Lucretia Ma. Uh, so there are things happening for ladies here. But after 1870, after 1870, when that amendment was passed, even just prior to this, that split. And the woman's agenda here will last almost 25 years. They'll come together again in the early 1890s, and that, so that National Woman's Suffrage Association and the American Woman's Suffrage Association will now become the National American Woman's Suffrage Association. And now they pool their forces. But interesting here, too, you know, in, in 1872, when, and I'll go into that deeper next week, when Susan B. Anthony got arrested for voting, and she'll beat that case, and I'll go into next week how she beats it, it's another step, in, in a way, another step forward. You know, keep in mind organizations like the Grange. The Grange supported the agrarians or the farmers. It's, it's, it's almost like a farmer's party or a farmer's union. They support 
woman's right to vote. The American Federation of Labor supported woman's right to vote. You know, your politics now are becoming more sophisticated. Of course, what's happening here since 1865? The industrialization of this country. Again, that is huge because how the country starts. And I understand slavery, I understand states' rights, I understand all that stuff. But the major reason, the major reason you're going to have a civil war is that, is, that, is that difference of opinion between that Jeffersonian notion of the agrarian as the salt of the earth and that the agrarian is the real protector of limited Republican elected government. Why? Because they dig in the dirt. And let's understand something. Your revolution, I understand that thing about freedom. I got that stuff in school too. Freedom, liberty, individual rights. Hogwash. Economic liberty is the reason for it. That's what some of these French revolutionaries are going to spout. Economic liberty. You have to own land. Ah, limited suffrage. Who votes? Landowners. Whether they're rich or whether they're large or small, they can vote. That's the sop to the common man. However, that's going to change as we go on. But the thing here is the Hamiltonian notion wins the war. And that's the North. Where were most of the factories? Where was most of the people? Who controlled the finance? Got to have that in a capitalist society. Who controlled most of the resources? The North did. They won what, is, what is, a, as, is an example of what's coming in 1914, industrialized, corporatized, commercialized war. And even here in the South, the so-called Southern Bell, which is, which is upheld up on a pedestal, guess what some of them have to do here by 1864-65? They're in a factory working for the Southern War effort. Boy, what happened with that one? You know... Cannonballs and mint juleps just don't quite match up here. <laughs> you know, it's not, it might not be Rosie the Riveter, but you know. However, having said that, by, 18, by the 1890s, as these, as these women begin to come together, our politics are maturing at the same time. Socialist party. <laughs> A socialist party. And interestingly enough, as the, as the earlier crop of suffragettes, I'm taught Anthony and Stone and, and, and Lucretia Mott and Stanton, they're getting older. I mean, Susan B. Anthony's born, you know, Susan B. Anthony's born 1820, Stanton's born 1815. How old do you think they are by the 1890s? They're getting older, yet the fresh crop is coming up. They're being born in this era. Eleanor Roosevelt, Margaret Sanger, how about 1898, Amelia Earhart, how about Helen Keller, who I'm going to wind up with in this series, who is a fascinating character politically, and it irks me that her, pol her politics are left out. I understand, you know, blind, deaf, uh, she, she's a remarkable individual, she truly is. But her politics are left out. Why? She was a flaming socialist. And that handout I have for that one, not everyone will get the same handout. Because I've archived a lot of her socialist writings, and so there's going to be four or five different handouts. And so each will have an example of her socialist writings. They're remarkable pieces of work. She was a good writer. Ah, yeah. That came from her. She sure did. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yeah, sure beats reading tweets. At least it's somebody that has a handle on the English language. And so, and so you, you, you see people, people like Keller. She'll support Eugene Debs every time he ran for president. Socialist. However, in 1878, as I mentioned, Susan B. Anthony, uh, you know, I think it was Senator Carson, I think his name was, he put forth legislation in 1878. Legislation to get the women the right to vote. It doesn't pass. But that legislation 
will be put back on the, on the shelves to gather dust and then 41 years later it will be brought out and it's that legislation that forms, the, forms really the essence of the 19th amendment here in 1820. But having said that, you are seeing more and more women gravitate to this. Alice Paul, nobody really speaks of her anymore. The National Woman's Party. Now some of these ladies, some of these ladies in the National Woman's Party, keep in mind when they took to the streets in 1917, we're at war after April 6, 1917. You can't do that. You can't do that. You're in a corporate war. Everyone's supposed to be on the same page here. And so these women take to the streets. Maybe now's the time to push the woman's agenda. Because by, by, by uh, Armistice Day, 1918, there's going to be 4 million American men in a uniform. 4 million. 2 million, 83,000 will be in France by Armistice Day. But as you have 4 million men in a uniform, that's 4 million less men on the farms and in the factories. Who's going to have to take up the slack? Ladies. And then it's going to be more pronounced after 1941. Because in that, in that conflict, 16,112,566 Americans were in a uniform. Most of them men. That was then 12.2% of the American population, hence Rosie the Riveter. And then those ladies, following people like Anita Snook and Amelia Earhart, are flying planes across the Atlantic for the guys to use once, they get, once those planes get to Europe. Uh, things are changing here. You know, so by 1945, it's kind of hard to say, sorry ladies, the deal is off, back to the kitchen. Kind of hard to say that at this stage. But this amendment will pass because, it, because in a war, these two, well no, there's only one war, 1914, 1922, 1931, 1945. But the two chapters of this war help really push women forward after 1945. But that 19th Amendment is interesting when you read it, how it's written. 19th Amendment. The, let's see. The rights of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state hmm. on account of sex. The word that was left out in 1870. Congress shall have the power again to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. On account of sex, or gender if you want to use that term. Sex sounds more apropos here, I guess. A little bit more oomph to the agenda here. And so, however, having said that, that's nice. Women can vote, and just in time for the 1920 election. But even if you contact the Commerce Department today, you're going to find, even today, women get paid 70% of what men get paid uh, for doing the same job, on the whole. And yet, too, when you go back to this era, this new crop of ladies is taking the agenda and running with it. Mentioned, and, I, and again, I'll get into uh, Helen Keller. And I like the, 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 the one-two punch here, because when I talk about Susan B. Anthony, you're talking about a lady in that first crop, and then when I do Keller, she's in that second class. Kind of gives you a difference as to where the, the movement is. But even at this stage, which didn't exist prior, it shows you where they're going. Margaret Sanger, talking about family planning and eugenics? Anthony didn't talk about this. Of course, it really didn't exist here, the idea of eugenics. You know, people like Sanger really pushing the idea of family planning. And this is the lady who said, and Helen Keller will pick up on this, but this is the lady who said, unless women have total control of their own bodies, they will never be the, they will never be the political equal of men. Never. Never. This is a lady who was interested in eugenics, but from the perspective of education, and that's how you start family planning. And she says that starts on the family level. And women have to have an equal, uh, equal vote here within the family discussing this as their husbands. And they should be able to, dis the, the, you know, to discuss and determine how many kids they're going to have. Getting around to the point, if you can't feed them, don't breed them. You know? And... 
And so she's later going to vilify the Nazis for what they did with eugenics. And keep in mind at the same time here, while Margaret Sanger is discussing this, even, even Helen Keller here in 1916 with George Kessler will form the Helen Keller Institute, which was a big pusher of women's health. Women should be able to not only help plan the family, but work in clean environments. They should be eating good food. They, 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 should, they should be able to have access to medical, medical care and that kind of thing. Because she was a big booster of, even though it didn't happen to her, her blindness and deafness are part of poor working conditions, poor medical care, things of this nature. Or maybe poor living conditions. She was a big booster of this. And yet you have people like, uh, people like, um, um, oh, now what is his name? No, now his name just left me. He wrote the book, The Passing of the Great Race. Madison Grant, that's it. Madison Grant, who at the same time is extolling, and, I, and I've got this book, and I, it's an interesting read, written in 1916, extolling the virtues here of the Nordic strain, even here. Oh yeah, he even writes here, why do, why, why, why do we want, <laughs> why do we want people from the Iberian Peninsula, Italy, and Eastern and Central Europe coming here? Oh, we don't mind Finns, Norwegians, Danes, Germans, French, Brits. The Anglo-Saxon, Nordic strain, that kind of thing. And yet, at the same time, while he's doing this, Margaret Sanger is doing her thing about, you know, women, health, pl family planning, so on and so forth. But that 19th Amendment does give women the right now to vote. That's a, that goes beyond the petition stage here of the 1860s. Recall what I said that, you know, Stanton and Anthony here, men ha might have the right to vote at this stage, but, but nobody says we can't, do, we can't push our agenda with petitions. Now you're going to push it both with petitions and the voting booth. However, something else comes out here. The amendment that came out before the woman's right to vote. Now this one's interesting too. The 18th Amendment, also ratified, ratified in 1919. Section 1. After one year from the ratification of this article, the manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors within the importation thereof into or the exportation thereof from the United States and all territories subject to the jurisdiction thereof for beverage purposes is hereby prohibited. The Volstead Act. Now this is something that women were involved in in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, the temperance unions. Why? Because of drunken husbands. And interestingly enough, when you got to the 1890s and the early part of the, of the 20th century, as women were pushing the agenda towards what's going to be the, the, the 19th Amendment in 1820, Breweries and distilleries were against women getting the right to vote. Because they thought if women get the right to vote, guess what's going to happen to them? Yeah, textile, textile factories, owners of textile factories, were also against the woman's right to vote. Why? Because they thought if women had the right to vote, they're going to influence Congress in outlawing child labor. Motherhood, children, you know how that, you know where that's going to go. So was that right to vote a big thing? Yeah, it sure was when you look at it from this perspective. I'm not saying maybe alcohol, limiting alcohol was the, well, you know where that's going to go. That's going to breed people like Johnny Torrio, Al Capone, Jaime Weiss, Dutch Schultz, Bugs Moran. Do you know Dutch Schultz used to have a house in Norwalk in the 1930s? Arthur Fliegenheimer, that was his real name. Of course, he'll get his in that restaurant in Jersey in 1935. They'll turn him into a screen door. <laughs> Murder Incorporated. The Bear Baron, the Dutchman. Yeah, Dutch Schultz. Wow. But that's what that breeds. Because that was discussed in Nor uh, that was brought up in Norwalk about you know the legalization of marijuana versus not legalizing marijuana, and um, Travis Sims, one of the elected officials in Norwalk, brought up the idea of maybe getting you know maybe impacting the black market here, 
And so when you go back and take a look at the Volstead Act, he's not entirely incorrect here. Because when they outlawed alcohol, again, you, you know, the mobs move in. It's a way to make money, right? It's a way to make money. And yet, interestingly enough, when Roosevelt was going to become president, that was repealed. And of course, people like Jake Greasy Thumbs Guzik, Capone's bookkeeper, are one of those that were saying, you know, let's get out of booze. No, 60 million a year says we stay in booze. No, nope, they're going to repeal it. Let's go, to, let's, go to, let's, go to the, let's go to drugs. You don't need breweries, you don't need pipes, you don't need trucks. All you need is a few packages in a closet. You know, the smell of these breweries must have been really, I mean, uh, must have, you don't think they're not, they're, a lot of those breweries got closed down, so they opened up new ones. But I mean, the fact of the matter is, that was what women were looking to do in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s, because of alcohol and abuse of husbands. And so distilleries and, 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 you know, and breweries, you know, companies that own these, didn't want women to get the right to vote. And so what happens with the, with the 18th Amendment? And then again, the textile companies. But child labor laws are coming. And so you're not going to be able to hire an eight-year-old kid with no shoes on running, running a machine at a textile mill eight, 10, 12 hours a day. And, and look, at, you know, I'm sure you've seen pictures of some of those machines. They're dangerous. They're man killers. And you got a kid here? And how much do you think they're paying the kid? Yeah, they're not really paying them that much. The kid, the kid couldn't even buy a newspaper. That's bad then. And so, yes, so there are changes coming here. Yes, because of the woman's right to vote. Yes. Well, that was what the Southerners, some Southerners were complaining about after the war. I mean, read some of those amendments that are applied to the Constitution, uh, you know, to fill out what was originally the Bill of Rights. You're getting away from this notion that uh, the, the right of the individual. I mean, the first 10, first 10 uh, points of the Bill of Rights is really to protect the individual from the infringements of government. Well, the country's changing itself. The country is changing itself. But keep in mind, as this thing grows bigger, it's not 13 states anymore, as this thing grows bigger, uh, can you really rely on states' rights or is central control necessary to keep it knit together? Well, yeah, it is. But even here, even here, in, sandwiched in between that a 15th Amendment and what's going to be the 19th Amendment, look at the Spanish-American War. I mean, that's a poster child expression here of what, of what, of the, the beginning, well, really the beginnings of what we have today. You know, the Militia Act, uh, 1792, which bolsters the Second Amendment, the right of the citizen to bear arms, you know, well-regulated. We don't have a well-regulated militia today. The National Guard is a bona fide reserve of the United States Army. The well-regulated militia disappeared. However, the, the 1792 Militia Act, the governors controlled the militia, not Washington. The state supplied the, the officers. Each of these guys, 18 to 45, you had to be in the militia. White men have to be in the militia. They bought their own powder, their gun, their own ball, their own pants, their own shirts, their own shoes, their own coonskin cap if they wanted it. And so in 1903, in that's going to change with the National Guard Act. You know, that was originally intended to keep a small regular army, but the governors control most of the army. There's a novel concept, a people's army. However, with the Spanish-American War, we're, no long, we're less interested in defending our homes, farms, and towns. We are now taking manifest destiny, and we're going overseas with it. And so the president has to have greater flexibility now in act, applying what was once a militia to the regular army if he needs bodies. And so it's no longer called the militia. It is now called the National Guard. And instead of... These guys being called up for three months, they can be now called up for nine. In 1916, that's going to be changed for the duration. Uh, these guys aren't buying their own guns anymore. The Army does. So as things like this happen, what's happening to the, the strength of the governors in the hold of their militias? It's going. And so, again, stronger central government. And you see here, beginning with the Civil War, and then carried forward 
in the night when we get into the first when we get into the 1914-18 conflict and then the second chapter from after Pearl Harbor to 45 what are you seeing here you are seeing what many Americans feared in 1860 now I'm um, now being now being amalgamated with big government in 1941 and an example of that is the defense plant corporation enacted by the Roosevelt administration he knows we're getting into this war so let's get ready. And so this defense plant corporation, this is a big corporation. They don't have stockholders. They got taxpayers. What do you need stockholders for? So they're using tax money to build millions of square feet of factory space so big corporations that are going to make the weapons, maybe they don't want, maybe Roosevelt doesn't want them spending money on factory space. The taxpayer will, and they'll lease it. So, <laughs> So they built millions of square feet of factory space based on the taxpayer. But here you're beginning to see big government, big business. Is that the essence of a corporate state? Uh, you know it is. Does that, does that lead to today's corporate socialism? You know it will. But this evolved over a period of time. And so when the Hamiltonian notion won in 1865, look what it's become by 2020. But it, did it knit the country together? Yeah, with the telegraph, the trains, big corporations. Gee, now they got a branch in Pennsylvania, they got one in California, or, or, you know, or more than that. Because in the 19th century, how many, how, many, how many big corporations did you really have? Not very many. Not very many. So this evolves in itself. And so what you have here is the essence of the corporate state. And with big corporations making more money, guess what they're able to do with some of that money? Plow it into the political system. And it's changed the country. But that was to be expected. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the husband is still the breadwinner here. The husband is still the breadwinner here. Uh, and who controls the money controls the agenda, basically, in the end. But are these steps towards uh, for a better life for women? Yeah, they are but there are lumps and bumps along the way. That's part of the lumps and the bumps here. But, but then again, when you go back to the night, when we get into the second chapter of that global conflict, uh, you know, more women have to work in the factories. And so again, does that help the woman's agenda really after 45? Yeah, it does, it does. I mean, look at even today, who's the Speaker of the House? Nancy Pelosi, right? <laughs> But then again, how many people besides her have been Speaker of the House twice? Nobody. Nobody. Not that I, not that I recall. In American history, nobody. And so, is that an advancement of a sort? Of a sort? Uh, and so, uh, maybe it's not the presidency. <laughs> maybe it's not the presidency, but is that an important political position? Speaker of the House? Yeah. Somebody like that decides which bills are going to be on, the, on, the, on deck and the other ones that are going to be on the back burner. I mean, that's, that's a big responsibility here. It truly is. It truly is. Uh, yeah, in interestingly, enough, interestingly enough, that amalgamation between Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, now that you've said that, you know, Stanton was married, her husband Henry Stanton, who actually was one of the co-founders of the Republican Party. But at the same time, you know, if Stanton and Anthony wanted to rent a hall for one of these women, women's gatherings, Stanton couldn't sign. Her husband would have to. But that's no problem for her. Susan B. Anthony's not married. She can sign. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. And so, yeah, they, uh, so somebody like a Stanton is impeded here from maybe being the lady she really wanted to be. In fact, her husband will criticize her for, have, you know, in the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, it's Stanton and that faction she's trying to put together that wanted to put on that platform woman's right to vote, and her husband told her it might be early for that, and he says, I can't support this. Well, I'm going ahead with this whether you support me or not, and she did. She did. Was he basically supportive of Yes, he was. Yeah. Right. Yeah, he was kind of a uh, social activist, but at the same time here, 
uh, he thought maybe that some of these ladies were going a little too far too fast and there would be a backlash. Well, Stanton knows there's going to be a backlash. You know, uh, there, there's, there's, you know you're going to get a backlash here. Uh, and so you roll the punches and stay in the fight. And that was, that was of course, Stanton, uh, interesting, you know, her and Susan B. Anthony will always be friends, but as they got older, Stanton actually became more radical. And she will write that book, The Woman's Bible, and she vilifies religion here, and she, and she, this woman's Bible, she brings up how women in the Bible are sec treated as second-class citizens. Of course, this is that era, you know, post-age of reason, enlightenment, where all these ideas are now unleashed, where people are calling convention into question. She's no different than some of the men are. She's no different, except she's a lady. So is she going to take it on the chin more so than some guys will? Probably. A woman, a woman's Bible? How is that sacrilegious? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, so now, now you're tweaking the nose of establishment with regards to religion. That's big. That is big. Right, right. Well, I mean, uh, Anthony will be, will be fortunate enough uh, by, by well into the 1850s to be a speaker of note. And she's going to give 75 talks a year, and she gets paid for them. And so she's, uh, she's making her own money. And not that she kept all that money, she would pour it back into the movement. Well, correct. She's going to keep it. <laughs> she's going to keep it. So that's a distinct advantage in the 19th century. You know. Uh, and, and, and give her credit for one thing, and you're going to hear this again, that this is a lady that pushed that horse and wagon even during rainstorms and snowstorms to get to that next town to give a talk. Ah, uh, that's pretty gutsy here. That truly is. She's very much committed to this agenda. Yes? Well, you know, interesting, again, how, how women were able to advance their cause here. I mean, I mean go, 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 go back to um, uh, Angelina Grimka in 1839, able to speak before a state legislature in Massachusetts. She's the first one able to do that. And yet it's going to be just over 100 years before a woman will be able to address a presidential convention. And that's Eleanor Roosevelt in 1940. Of course, her being the first lady, I'm sure, must have, had, must have helped. Uh, but then again, this is a lady. You know, now you have modern communications and, uh, travel and, and transportation as opposed to the 19th century. But this is a lady who in 12 years will give 348 press conferences. And so are, so are things advancing here for women? Oh, yeah, decidedly so. But as there, again, is there still a ways to go? Uh, yes, there is. Yes, there is. Yes. Yeah, well, I mean, still, it's still a man's world. Yeah. Uh, women are educating themselves, and that's going to have to be a, a, a big plus. Reading? Reading alone. And writing. And writing. And speak. And speak. Well, again, you'll find out next week how... Uh, one of the biggest criticisms that uh, Susan B. Anthony had was men who tried to stop women from speaking. God forbid. You know. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, go, going back, to, and I think I mentioned this last week, when women were admitted into the American Anti-Slave uh, uh, Association in 1838, 1839, and gee whiz, it, uh, men had to debate this. Well, you know, when only 1% of the northern population is into the abolitionist movement, and you're trying to perpetuate this movement, and you're not getting enough men, who else are you going to invite if you want to increase your numbers? Women. However, when they do become members, women want to be on the committees. Women on committees here? They have to debate that. And then when they become committee members, women speak? we got to debate that one. And so, and so, you know, I mean, it, it, you know, my wife and I were discussing this. I said, well, you and I are both uh, Abbott and Costello fans. Remember what Abbott and Costello once said, every knock is a boost. And so, yeah, they're getting knocked, but they're able to boost their agenda little by little by little by little in these incremental steps at a time here. 
they're able to do that. And the big thing, and, that, and this is big, and, and I don't think it's given enough credence, by women becoming part of this anti, American Anti-Slave Association, they are now getting their message, because they join the abolitionists, they are getting their message into abolitionist newspapers. That's big. Before, they were being starved for publicity. But since some of these abolitionists, again like William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, who supported the woman's agenda, and now they've taken them on into the abolitionist movement, some of the stories, you know, some of the articles here for woman's, woman's agenda are now in abolitionist newspapers. So does that help them as well? Yes, it does. Because now they're getting in, they're not, now they're appearing on the, on the printed word here, the, the, the newspapers. And which is the, what, the 19th century internet? If you want to use that terminology here. Yes, and then I'll move over. Yes. Well, it's like, you know, Harriet Tubman. You know, escaped slave, abolitionist, actually helps to lead northern troops behind Confederate lines because they understood of her, her, her experience of operating behind Confederate lines, bringing slaves out. So they're going to use her for military. She's not going to be rescuing slaves, but for military purposes, she knows how to operate behind Confederate lines. So why not use her for that? And so, interestingly enough, a, a woman who's a uh, behind the lines slash guerrilla expert, and she's black, not white. Yeah, you can't leave that out. That's significant. That is extremely significant. That part of her life is significant. And it just show and then and then after the war's over, she's gonna become a suffragette. She'll join that movement. I mean there that, there's a lot happening in that life. A lot. Yeah. 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 But but again, as as women advance their agenda, you know, women are gonna more women will be educated. I mean when when I first went to Noah Community College, there were hardly any blacks or Latinos. And now it seems now 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 that I you know I go teach there. Uh, there's a lot of women as students. There's a lot of women as teachers. More blacks, more Latinos. Have we been able to open it up? Well, yeah, that's proof of that. That's proof of that. And, and look, that nursing program they have there, it's a darn good nursing program. Yeah, look at how many, well, oh Christ, there's, there's, there's male nurses, I'll give you that. But look at the nurses they're turning out. And they're not just white, black, Latino, whatever the case may be, who cares? You know, as long as they're competent, who cares? Uh, but you're, see you're seeing that, which is, I think, terrific. I think terrific.